Please rise, salute the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For those in the public tonight, we're going to start off with a special voting meeting. Um, the purpose initially will be to uh, select a replacement for an open position on the school board. Um, Mr. Martino, would you call the roll, please? Yes, Mr. Wolf. Mrs. Bites. Here. Mr. Kurtz. Here. Mr. Martino here, Mr. Ocas O'Neill. Here. Mr. Ratcliffe. Here. Mr. Scott. Here. Ms. Berdowski. Here. Ms. Wolf, uh, Mr. Wolf. Here. Mr. Wolf is here. Okay. Um, there are no uh, announcements uh, for agenda uh, changes. Uh, the procedures for public participation are printed inside the uh, blue handout that you have. Um, at the appropriate time, you can approach the microphone. If you haven't already done so, please sign in in the back. And when you approach the podium, sign in there. Also, state your name and your address for the record, and you'll have three minutes to approach the board. Okay, so how we're going to start this, we have two, two individuals that are interested in serving on the board. Um, Mr. Scott Potts and Mr. Mark Durr, Durr, hopefully I got that right. Okay, I assume that's you. All right. Um, what we'll do is first uh, we'll introduce each one of you, come up and introduce yourself, give us a little information about yourself, why you want to serve on the board. Um, then we'll open up to board questions for each of you individually. So we'll start in our alphabetical order. Mr. Durr, if you can come up. Just tap the gray uh, button on there. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're interested in serving on the school board? Okay. Well, my name is Mark there. I'm a resident of First Row, um, 820 Madison Street. And uh, I would like to serve on the board um, to help participate in. The community. Um, I spent 14 years uh, in various progressive roles in my profession, um, managing multiple franchise restaurants and overseeing um, multi million dollar budgets and a numerous amount of uh, staff. In that time, I've had the pleasure of working with multiple different companies, um, enhancing operations, and Improving different processes within my organization um, due to extreme um, circumstances with my profession, I wasn't able to um, accept a, a chance to run in the primary last year when Region Three was uh, offering uh, new candidates to vote for school board positions, and um, I now have the great pleasure of. Contributing my time, experience, and knowledge to their service community. Are there any uh, questions for the candidate, for the school board member? All right. It doesn't seem like my microphone is working. Um, my question is just in regard to specifically taxation, because you know the board has the responsibility to levy property taxes. <coughs> What is your philosophy on when the board should consider raising taxes and in general spending issues? It's a great question. Um, so my position on taxation is that um, everything that we have as a community operates on budget. And we have opportunities to control our expenses or earn additional income as a business. And if the expenses outweigh our income, then we need to make the decisions to increase our income. Okay, thank you. Thank you. 
Chairing every question? Mr. Chair, if I may, I have not, I, I don't remember seeing you at any of our meetings. So what would it take for you to get up to speed on what the board's doing and, and needs to have done? I've been taking a look at the previous agendas from school board meetings, minutes, and uh, public posts on the internet. Um, I've stayed in contact with multiple families throughout the board, um, throughout the district, and keeping me up to date with different um, agendas that we have and uh, different programs that we're looking to bring into the community. I would say that through the information that I've been able to keep up to date with on the internet and the additional free time that I have now to be able to commit to the board and to the district, uh, that I'd be ready to jump right in. Thank you. I just had a question. How long were you, have you been a member of the district? Of the district? A resident of the district? Since 2009. Do you have any students presently in the system? I do. I have, I have four children. Um, a student in the high school, a student in the elementary school, um, and also a faculty Thank you. Thank you. What do, you, what do you hope to uh, achieve personally by being on the board? I would love to increase the knowledge of um, the different things that the school board is able to do for the community, do for the students, and to be a positive member and influence them. Um, any way that I can increase my knowledge and gain more experience <coughs> as, a, as a member of the community would be beneficial. And you said you had um, been keeping tabs on the agenda. I do you have any thoughts on um, the recent uh, topic of how we utilize our space and the, the, uh, the thought of potentially having to close the school in the next five years? Absolutely. And definitely the topics that we are discussing as a board will have long-term consequences, whatever the decision is that we may choose, um, whatever best benefits the district and the students. I'm sure we'll come to the proper decision. And do you have any ideas up on your own as far as like how the district could generate more revenue aside from raising taxes? I would, would be interested in sharing different programs that are willing to give back to the students, give back to the community. Um, maybe look into a partnership with other outside vendors. Mr. Darrow, one, one more question. Looking back over the past couple of years, what of the things the board has done in the past two years, the decisions that have been made, which ones do you like and which ones would you have done something different? <laughs> I mean, I'm only one person. Um, I would love to be a part of the decisions and process making that the school board has taken into Out there say. Um, we've done some great things with the programs implementation into the into the, the different school districts. Um, you know, some of the needs to consolidate students may be a little controversial, but um, at the same time, it seems to be the benefit of the school district, the benefit of the students. Is there any other questions? Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Potts? Mm -hmm. Mr. My name is Scott Potts. I'm the Lancaster Valley Road of Roseburg. I've been here since 1985. Uh, two children in the district. One graduated in 2010. The other graduated in 2017.
probably some of the uh, greatest things that I can think about on the board is it's really about the student, but it is also about the, the taxpayer. We have a fiduciary responsibility to the student living within the fiscal constraints uh, of our district. I can think of that immensely. Uh, looking back at some board decisions, I never really concentrated on too much. I, I, I will say from the first day I came on to the board in 2009, it's a pretty nervous process, uh, jumping right in, getting served on certain committees. And I will tell you that my last day on the board, I was just as nervous then, thinking on what decisions the, the future board would make for the students of the district. Thank you. Any board questions? Same question as Mr. Durr. Mm -hmm. You've been off the board for a little over two years. In, in that two years, what do you think the board has done good? What, you, what would you have done different? Well, getting back to that so-called maintenance tax, I, I think you're going to have to really review that. I think maybe that could have been instead of holding, could it be could have maybe brought that up a small percentage to bring some revenue in. Uh, we can't live on a rainy day fund. Obviously, that we're close to at the time when we left, it was at, at minimum. Uh, but obviously, the deficit is uh, not as great as what it was when we were there. So, from hearing you correctly, if you get on the board, you're coming on with a mindset automatically the taxes need to be raised. No, I would say it, it's going to be in the back of my mind if we do all our diligence on uh, every line item that we. Yeah, for it. Obviously, you're going out for proposal for building some grounds. You're going for our RFPs for transportation. Uh, I'd be very curious to see what I can aid in, in transportation. I think going to be at our last meeting. I think we can uh, I can supply a lot of information with that. Also, working with contractors 
and outside uh, other vendors. Thank you. And taxes aside, any I'd like to hear your thoughts on how the district can generate revenue. Well, obviously, Mr. Harris had some ideas in our brief conversation a few months ago. I'd be curious to see if we could bring some outside. You know, we do have great facilities. Uh, are we utilizing them to the best? I don't believe so. Uh, you know, we did have, I did bring in uh, Red City Gallup Homes back in 2010. It was a small revenue stream. It was several thousand dollars for two years. Uh, you know, things, things, things of that nature. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, what I'm looking for is a, a motion for both candidates. And once we have a second, and Mr. Uh, Martino would call the roll and you would state the name of the person that you wish to be seated. Have, um, well, first of nominations. No one, one nomination for two, okay. two names. And I nominate Mr. Potts and Mr. Durr, uh, school directors from Region Three to fill the vacancy left by the resignation of Brian Doty. Thanks immediately the term in the first week of December 2017. The second. Second. Motion made, made by Mr. Kurtz, second by Mr. Rathgeb. For discussion. Well, Harry, you need to give me a name. Mrs. Bites. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Kurtz. Mr. Potts. Mr. Martino, Mr. Durr. Mr. Ocas O'Neill. Mr. Durr. Mr. Raskin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Scott. Mr. Durr. Mr. Dasky. Mr. Potts. And Mr. Wolf. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts, congratulations by a vote of five to three. Would you please come forward? Thank you, Mr. Kerr, for your interest and for applying. Congratulations, Mr. Potts. You've just lost a lot of free personal time. Yes. Okay. Um, the next uh, item on the special agenda is number nine, a motion to uh, appoint the following. Um, Mr. Eiselman uh, is looking for this person to be approved tonight to get him on board as soon as possible. So I'm looking for a motion for 9-1-A. So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Rathgeb, second by Ms. Tordowski. Discussion? I just noticed that the daily rate is about two and a half times what our substitute rate is. And I know we have some difficulty with bringing substitutes. So I'm just curious if this is the going rate for um, 
long-term substitute or where that Mike, can you make that say prorated, please? I mean, whenever you've seen the long-term sub, that's usually what oh, it's prorated. Prorated. You want to correct that with, with uh, prorated at 256 11 a day. What's a prorated from? From the day he starts. There you go. Your well, that's true. To, uh, You're okay. Start step, you bachelor know. start step divided by 187 in your contract. You're right about 256 Okay, so it's just prorated based on the per diem. Okay, thank you. Any other board discussion? Voice vote, Mr. Martino. Yes, on the item 9A, uh, approving. Mr. Miller, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes 9 0. Okay, number 10 is a motion to approve the Blazer Summer Program as presented. The board did move to approve the creation. This is more of a formality to approve the program as it was presented to us. I'll make that motion. Second. Second. Here we go. We're going to give it to Mr. Scott. Yeah, we're going to give it to Mr. Scott since he rarely makes a second. <laughs> so, starting to get more comfortable now. Yeah. Um, any board board discussion? I have a question. Um, why is that part of the special voting meeting as opposed to the regular voting meeting next week? Because I wanted it on there. Maybe I hope it's more scientific than that. No, the, the, it's not. This. We need to start. We need to start getting. We need to start getting the word out that it worked. We need to start. We we need to start getting the advertisement out and start to enroll students into the program. Right. So My understanding of the agenda meeting was that since we had already discussed the whole Blazer Summer thing and we were having a special voting meeting that there's time and there's a, and planning wise timeline there's a March 22nd open house for okay. Blazer Summer. I would just caution the board not to get too reckless in that regard that we just routinely vote at the, uh, in the workshop meeting on uh, you know, major initiatives like this. Well, sometimes it's driven by timing. You know, ideally, we want to keep the voting meeting to the voting meetings. Thank you. In this case, with the presentation being the day after the voting meeting, it doesn't give a lot of time. So. Yeah, I just like that. I appreciate us having a special voting meeting and not voting during the committee of the whole, because we have been having a voting during the committee of the whole, which is supposed to be discussion. So I'd like to set up to that. Thank you. Okay. Um, so uh, we have a motion by Mr. Kravowski, second by Mr. Scott. Um, there's no more board discussion. Or a roll call vote. Roll call vote. Mr. Martino, yes. Mr. Urquiz O'Neill. Yes. Mr. Potts. Yes. Mr. Rathke. Yes. Mr. Scott. Yes. Mr. Kravowski. Yes. Mrs. Bites. Yes. Mr. Kurtz. Yes. Mr. Wolf. Yes. Motion passes 9 0. Okay, the next uh, item on the agenda is the RBC Capital Summary. Yeah, yeah, you have it already. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yes, that's this is a fancy color one. Yes, that's what we sent out on Friday. Can you just shut up? Boom. Just tap here. Yep. How's that? Perfect. Yeah, so those are the same. I wasn't sure if you were going to have copies of that. Do you have some for the public? I'm sorry? Do you have copies for the public? No, those are the only There's one in their book. That I think I down. Ate one. So I'll, I'll do just a, no. a really brief recap for book. you. Uh, we were obviously really here a week and a half ago for the finance committee meeting to talk about a refinancing opportunity. Um, if you turn to page two to see the issue that we're focused on and, and that we are 
have been monitoring, really working closely with the business office over the last year as we were working on the other refinancing that we've done over the last two years. And I think to put it in magnitude of this opportunity, the savings on the 2007 bonds that the business office has been keeping track of are in excess of $3 million. And the two, I'm sorry, the three refinancings that the school district has undertaken in the last two and a half years produced about $2.4 million of debt service savings for the school district. So you're obviously very vigilant, took advantage of the low interest rates that we've enjoyed over the last couple of years, and we've been refinancing portions of the 2008 issue to generate that $2.4 million of savings. And some of that you can see is still uh, to occur in some of your future budgets when you look at column 10 and the lower debt service amounts that are there in 2016 and 2017 and then eventually getting back up to the running rate of your annual debt service which has been just under about seven million dollars per year so the discussion that we had a week and a half ago at the finance committee meeting was really what is the timing of doing that 2007 refinancing and the answer there is under normal circumstances we wouldn't be able to issue the bonds and lock in an interest rate until either December of this year or January of, of next year to coincide with the call date of those 2007 bonds, which is in April of 2017, so we're about a, a year away from that call date. When we use today's interest rates and project where those savings would be, if today's interest rates are available, when we got to December or January, that's what's producing about $3.5 million of savings. And so that was the question that the business office had was, is there an opportunity that we could try and lock in those savings, either some portion, some strategy, so that the district is not at risk of getting to the end of the year and if interest rates had risen substantially, those savings having gone down by some amount. So that's what led to the discussion of uh, the way that you could do that in terms of locking in a rate for a short term period and we had that uh, extensive discussion. You ask us to modify a couple of the options that we talked about. So we have done that and I've brought it the page forward a little bit so you didn't have to flip so many pages. On page five is the summary of all of the refinancing options that we were looking at a week and a half ago in the finance committee meeting. And the first request was on the plain vanilla refunding to take the savings over the next five fiscal years and see what that would look like. So in column one, that base case scenario, which is wait until it's a current refunding, take today's interest rates, assume they're available at the end of the year, and do that and structure the savings to occur over five budgets. And so if you look in those first five years, 2018 through 2022, you can see there's about just under $800,000 of savings that would occur over those five years. Up in the box in blue, the, pre the second line, we kept all, all those numbers in the same order as the last time around. The net present value savings of spreading it over the five years is uh, that number about 3.7 million. So that's what that option would look like. The other request was if you did that refunding, but extended the debt for five years longer than what it is right now. What does that look like? We drop that column, uh, or that scenario in on the far right, that's column number seven, labeled as scenario four. That's basically doing the same thing as column one, at the same interest rates, except we've extended a small portion of the debt out five years, and you can see that the annual savings each year there probably averages out to somewhere around 435,000 per year. So we've gone from what we were looking at a week and a half ago where we had like a million dollars a year for the first couple of years, if you just kind of pushed it all to the front, to a five-year option spreading it out over five years, to column seven, which is if you actually extended the debt for five more years, you would have those annual savings of about 400 and some thousand per year. Uh, present value up in the top, again, not, not a real big difference. You'd be about 3.5 million in that column seven. 
by taking it over the longer time frame versus the 3.7 million that you would be at with the savings over five years. And really that's, that's reduced by the fact that you're extending the debt for five additional years. When you look at those last five years, it actually works out that we're not extending very much debt. It's a, a couple million out of the entire issue is all that ends up getting extended. But by any means, it's, it's different than the refinancings that we just did over the last couple of years where it was simply just going from a higher rate to a lower rate and you're keeping the same final maturity date. There's no change there. So that's what that option looks like. Any questions? That was a request to look at those two options. Since I wasn't at the uh, finance committee, who, who asked for that? There's <laughs> no wrong answer. I just wanted to see what the. I was, I was kind of keen on seeing what, uh, instead of taking, taking your savings. Uh, that thinking that the savings all up front, if we were to, to try and, and uh, uh, spread that savings out over, over more years, um, you know, because my, my only thought process there was, um, you know, the, the, if you have it all up front, you know, it's, it's good for a couple of years and then we're, we're not in the hole again, whereas if we can uh, spread these savings out over uh, a number of years, perhaps that's, that's better for a, a budgetary piece, but uh, you know, I wasn't sure. I wasn't I have several questions. One in regard to this. When can we do this again? When will we be eligible to, to refinance more bonds? This specific issue, if you went ahead and, and did this refinancing? Yes. So we would typically, on an issue of that size, probably have an eight year call feature. So once you would do it and lock in those new rates, you would have to wait another eight years until those bonds then. And what about the other issues? The other issues, if you flip back to uh, page two and look at the call dates across the bottom of the page, column four, the 2008 issue, we've mentioned there, there are still some bonds left of that that we didn't carve off in the three previous refinancings. So that's still an opportunity. That call date is in 2018. And as we get closer and closer to that, those refinancings uh, will be more efficient. So that really is, is the next opportunity is to continue to refund a little bit of that 2018 issue, uh, of the 2008 issue. Because when you look across there then, you'll basically have to wait until the 2014 issue, which isn't until 2020. But as you know from how much savings we generated, those interest rates are really, really low on the 2014 bonds. So even if we took these savings over the next two or three years, we do have other options in, in 2018. Right. The one thing I, I don't like about an extension, when we talk about extension, we're talking about going from 2033 to 2038. Right. You know, and, and okay, because that's the one thing I don't like about it. We're already in debt for another 17 years. Um, two other questions. I, I have a the business section of the Philadelphia Inquirer from Saturday, March 5th, and it talks about Pennsylvania's credit rating again potentially being cut. Right. What would that do to our refinancing? That's a good question. We talked about this the, the last couple of times we've been here, obviously, with the ongoing budget crisis. Um, right now, the, the school district's credit rating has remained OK. Um, you haven't been impacted. Some districts have, in fact, had their credit ratings downgraded uh, due to the, the cutbacks in, in the state subsidies that aren't flowing to school districts. Uh, right now, if nothing changes in terms of, of kind of your financial status, I wouldn't anticipate that there would be any change in your credit rating from where we've been, um, unless I'm not aware of any significant change in your situation, I wouldn't expect your rating to change just as a result of anything else happening with the state's credit rating. 
we've obviously already seen the state's intercept program be downgraded as a result of the budget impasse. You've seen that then ripple uh, through to some of the school districts that rely on the intercept program. You are fortunate, as we've discussed before, your credit rating is better than that intercept program, which is why we were able to get such good interest rates on the last three refinancings when we did them. So you're a bit isolated from that impacting you. Two more questions. Without me digging through my folder over here, how much different are, are these savings from what you presented at the Finance Committee meeting? Uh, good question. Interest rates, since we were last year about a week and a half ago, have risen a bit. Uh, all of these savings, because we updated these on Friday, are about $200,000 less than where they were a week and a half ago. And that's simply because we've seen interest rates rise uh, during this the time, time frame since we've updated these for you. So all of those numbers, when you look at the, the savings analysis page, all of those numbers, savings are down roughly around $200,000 because interest rates today are a little bit higher. And this is purely a, a layperson's question. Now we've heard your presentation. We have what I think is an excellent business manager. We have several people on the board that work in finance. Why do we need a swap advisor? State law requires it. Okay. Two, uh, two questions. Um, I'll burn it too fresh in case I haven't given it out. Um, so the, the bonds, so when we reissue, we are going to reissue with that being call? Yes. So exactly. what if we went out with a, a non-call issue, would we get a better rate? We always looked at that. Um, the argument is that if it's non-callable, the investor is going to pay you, uh, willing to lend the money at a slightly lower interest rate. Historically, in Pennsylvania, you've been better off to retain the flexibility when we look back at the refinancings that we've just done, had those 2008 bonds, 2008 rates looked pretty good then. But in I'm fact, just wondering if we're as down as low as we want to go, and well, yeah, could, 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 you, could go lower, right? Um, but I'm wondering if, if that might, might be an interesting option. It's a good question, and we could price it and get an indication of rates and say, okay, where would these rates be when we go to the investors when we're at that point in time if we made these non-callable? Because the market norm really is to have an eight to 10 year call on this, when you say, well, we're gonna make it non-callable, the market norm is to have a call, so an investor's not gonna reward you too much more by saying, well, it's, it's, it's non-callable. There would be some advantage. I think one of the things to think about is because it's a significant amount of your debt structure that typically it's always good to retain your flexibility that who knows five or ten years from now whether it's state funding has changed or we're in the, a, a terrible recession and you're forced to restructure debt there's just no other option if your debt is all non-callable we can't really do anything with it we can't reshape it and restructure it if you retain a call feature you at least have that flexibility if you're ever backed into the corner that we could restructure it and, and extend it if you had to do that. So that's why typically our advice is retain your call feature. The market doesn't reward you too much more to make them not callable. And, and then the um, the option with the, the five-year extension, then obviously that um, uh, is that priced in with the, with the swap or Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I, have a I have a couple of questions. Please. Sure. Um, I'll be honest with you. All this language, um, swap, hedge, negative arbitrage, I know um, it's dressed up real nice, but it does make me nervous. Sure. And it does make me question whether school districts should be involved in this at all. And I'm, I'm not suggesting it's not legal. I understand that it is. Right. Um, but I, uh, specific to that question, I, I see reference to a negative arbitrage that we could be, um, let me read the whole sentence. While cash settled swaps have unrecoverable forward premium and transaction costs, this can be compared to the unrecoverable costs from negative arbitrage and advanced refunding escrow. Can you explain that to me and explain exactly what the maximum the school district could use, could lose? Sure, sure. The 
On the refinancings that we did, I, I think you were here for those refinancings in the last couple of years that we just did. The call date on those, as we just talked about those 2008 bonds, the call date's not until 2018. So if we look at the issue that we just did last year, we borrowed the money at 3%. So we had to take it and invest it until those bonds are called in 2018. You know how low investment rates are, so we invested it at close to zero. The trend, that difference of having that money invested for the next two years at close to zero, because we borrowed at three and it's invested at zero, we refer to that as negative arbitrage. So that's what we're saying. We still proceeded with those previous refundings mm -hmm. because you still saved about $750,000 even after that was taken into account. So we looked at it and said, the transaction was still very efficient. It basically cost us by incurring the negative arbitrage, mm -hmm. that reduced the savings. And so that's where it's very similar that if you incur costs like to do the swap to lock in the rate now, that cost is basically unrecoverable and if if interest rates don't change at all between now and say January when we would sell these bonds, if they don't change at all, of course the best thing, course of action would be that we did nothing and we sell bonds at that point right. and we haven't incurred really any costs. Right. If you think rates are gonna rise and you wanna try and protect today's rates so that they're there in January, right. you have That's to incur issue. that cost. And so yeah. that cost is what we're saying is very similar to the cost that we incurred by doing the advance refundings on those previous issues. Except those were done at the same time. We didn't have to invest in a swap uh, to gamble uh, as far as a time frame. In the future, right, you weren't, you weren't, the time frame right, you weren't using a tool like the swap right. to lock and that in. That is correct, right. yes. Good. Um, so uh, on the last swap, RBC was the swap dealer, I believe. And the counterparty, I think, was Wachovia. Is that correct? Wachovia was who had done that swap originally for you back in 2007, I think it was. So we weren't involved in it. Okay. And so that's, that's who you, back in 07, the district entered into that. And that was a totally different type of swap. That was one that was really done for cash flow purposes. It was supposed to generate cash flow to the right. district. Now, if I read the resolution of that one, the, the resolution, would, that, would the wording be the same except for the terms, the term? Because I, is, is it the same vehicle, basically, the swap instrument from 2007 with different? It, I mean, you're using a, a swap contract, but it was totally different principle right. where you were exchanging two variable rates. What we're looking at on this is just trying to lock in a right. fixed rate I so got that. that. We but can the instrument is that. the same, right? That's a cash settlement instrument and this is a cash settlement instrument? The, the swap that you had done, the really the biggest difference is the one that was done back in 07 was basically set up to go for, it was 25 right. years. Right. It was a yeah. long-term agreement. Whereas what this is, is we're basically proposing that this would be in effect between Just now and months. next April right. it is the uh, max that if if we had to wait that long until right up to the call date, which would be April of 2017, you're looking at a one-year window that you would have this instrument outstanding. And again, that's you know what we discussed last week was this being a much more efficient and safe short-term use of this type right. of contract. I and, understand that. And, you know, what, the variability. Right, right. And so, what's important, obviously, is the fact that the question was about you, know, you still need under state law, you need a, a swap advisor that would basically explain the same thing to you, that that's a different type of instrument. We're obviously explaining to it, um, to it as well. So um, RBC is both the swap dealer and the counterparty to the swap. And as such, your fees are, as the counterparty, is the 500,000, right? And as the swap dealer, it's the 160? Is that, no. no, let's go to the let's go to the I'm page. looking at the disclosures. Okay. Let's go to page six. I'm sorry, I'm missing that page eight. So page eight. On 
on page eight last week, or a week and a half ago, we reviewed locking in the swap just using the LIBOR index, okay? And if you look there, second bullet point where it says LIBOR hedge, we talked about that most of the cost of this is the actual cost of locking it in in advance. So that forward premium that you're locking something in for a delivery on April 1st. Right. So you can see there that that cost, which is market driven, right now is 13 basis points. Okay. For a total of 475, right? Yes, and the actual the fee for putting that transaction together is the six basis points. Add those two together, that's the, the 19, at a value of a basis point right now on your transactions about twenty-five thousand. So, so that's that four hundred seventy-five thousand cost of logging in the rate for the forward delivery. And so, in all of those savings analysis that we looked at, obviously that's incorporated. I, I understand. I'm just okay. trying to be clear on fees. Sure. For full disclosure. Sure. sure. Yep. So it's six basis points for RBC as the swap dealer. I'm just trying to make sure I'm reading the disclosure sure. right. Yep, yep. As a swap dealer, you're going to collect six basis points, right? right? Six times 25,000. The, the, the counterparty, yes. As the counterparty. It's the same word being used interchangeably. It does, um, specifically in the disclosure though, it does make it a point to, 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 to point out to the district that you are acting as two different parties and um, in those capacities, you're not required to act in our best interest, nor without regard for your own financial and other interests. Right. I'm just trying to understand sure. those interests. And that's one of the, the different that's one reasons why you do hire a swap advisor, right. because they do have traditional degrees in the district. Right. But we're paying them to yes. six hundred thousand right. um, dollars for their capacity as counterparty. As the, the, other, the other piece, which actually I had asked, okay. Which, okay. Which, okay, you can clarify. Which does say you? Because uh, I don't no, know. Then the RBC don't. And I'm not, you know, RBC, this is their business, so they are going to make money on it. But they're also going to make money issuing the bond. Because they're you're the underwriter of the bond as well, right? Right. Yeah. So they also uh, get money for underwriting the bond as well. And that's not in this discussion at all, though, right? The bond well, that will be reissued in when we execute the swap? You'll be issued, the plan would be to issue bonds heads. in and December or January. Right. right. At that point in time, we're out. A whole different other part of it right. selling your bonds and right and that commission for that right, right, would be right. a not but that's already factored into all these savings numbers all of these I savings numbers yeah. are net of the issuance yeah. costs. Yes. okay so let's look at those savings real quick yeah. so and again just for clarity because i'm not exactly sure on this stuff right. but scenario 1a uh, assumes that current rates uh that we're at today uh, are present when at the at the mature at the call date of the lease, of the lease. and the savings potential then based on today's numbers. The second is, line. Uh, three point nine, right? Uh, three point six nine eight. Okay. Uh, which color one? Have a date March fifteen. Right? We're on page March five. 15. Okay. I, I'm looking up in the blue at the present okay. value calculation. Oh, okay. I got okay. So it's the second line. Savings. Savings. We will, if we do nothing with uh, with RBC, and we just and the rates don't change, that's what we would have the potential savings. Right. When we went out for the variable that we're on now, lock in the current fix, which is right around three point two eight percent. Right. So, so that's basically waiting until January of 2017. And today's interest rates are available then. Right. Your savings are the 3.6. Okay, so if yep. we go with the hedge and we pay the fees, the points, the basis points, and the same scenario occurs that there's no change, yep. I'm looking at scenario 2A, column 3. Correct. Or, and PV savings would be 3.2. Correct. So we will have spent $600,000 to have only affected 400000 more in savings, right? You basically protect it by spending that money. You've protected that you're going to have three point two million. But I'm saying, in the assumption, comparing one and three. Oh yeah, if rates if rates lost. don't change, we lost because we rates, spent three six hundred thousand, yep. and we would have it's four hundred thousand dollars difference that, for that insurance. Right. 
Okay. Which is, if you think about it, that's, if I'm reading this right, that's the cost of the transaction. Now, one more question. One more question then. All these scenarios uh, give us assumptions based on current rates if they don't change, 50 basis points up or 50 basis points down. Yep. So are we into the big losses, the big, we lost the you know, big roulette spin, gamble, if they're outside of this range? No, no. What happens if, uh, if interest rates go up, if we do, if we lock in the hedge and they go up to, yep. you know, 200? Let's just say 100 basis Yeah, no, that, that's a, it's a very good happens. question. And that's where we got into that discussion last week of, you know, the one risk that we, none of us can protect against is what's happening with where you issue municipal bonds. Yep. If something happens like the school district's credit rating goes below investment grade or we're ready to issue bonds, your interest rate's gonna be higher than what the so current market what assumptions like, What does it cost us? What happens? Explain it to me, because I lost that discussion. It, I couldn't follow that one. <laughs> there's really no way to put a price tag on it, but as long as the Can market is- Can we lose a million dollars? Because I heard a million mentioned for right, right. years. Why don't we look at page, part of the, the next question that we didn't get to yet was how does SIFMA trade versus the index for where you issue municipal bonds? and LIBOR, and that, that, that's what, what led to the question. So we put together for you, because of that request, we put together for you two pages, page nine and 10, to really show what we talked about last week, which is, say if your worst case scenario is, we get to this January, and what happened in 2008 is happening again, that mm -hmm. the bond market, interest rates in the bond market have gone, if you look on page nine, and you look uh, towards the end of 2008, right before the 2009 hash, you see that one blue line that went higher for about four data points? That's the height of the financial crisis. And at that point in time, nobody wanted to buy municipal bonds. Rates kind of spiked, but you can see that the two other indexes, SIPMA and LIBOR, didn't really move. So that's the one risk that we can't protect against in that when we get there and we need to issue bonds, if interest rates are up here mm -hmm. and the cost to terminate the swap hasn't moved, we, we can't measure what that cost is. Our assumptions for all of these for funding analysis is based on the big chart that for the most part, they've always moved together, mm -hmm. the municipal bond market and the SIFMA or LIBOR, they've been moving together so that whether interest rates go up, if you did this, if interest rates went up by 200 basis points, the fee that you collect by terminating the swap will offset the fact that you're gonna issue bonds at those higher interest rates and you still have the 3.2 of savings. So that's where you don't know, really care if rates go up by 200 or down by 200 or only up by 50 or down by 50. As long as these are moving together, you should be okay. We can't guarantee that. We can just look at the data and say, historically they have, with the exception of the financial crisis, when, when clearly things malfunctioned for a couple of weeks. I think that was four data points there where rates in the municipal bond market were not connecting to where rates in the swap market. So what was the mention, what was the scenario for the mention of a million dollar loss um, at the finance meeting? What, what is the, uh, likely, not likelihood of that, but the scenario that was discussed? I think we were talking about the term, the cost to terminate the swap. Okay, so being, that, there's no ceiling on being, that? Right, so let's, let's go back to page, risk. let's go back to page five, because again, that's gonna be offset by what's happening with interest rates. And on page five. Cor correct me if uh, your colleagues were mentioning 125 basis points before the fee would be lost. Is that, that meeting? Would that be correct? I think one of the questions was basically what's the break even? How much would rates have to go up? And that break even is really the cost of, of doing the transaction. So if it costs you 19 basis points to do it, if rates go up by more than 19, you're, you're, you're better, you're ahead at that point. If rates only go up by 15 basis points, then you're not quite ahead, you've paid a little bit more. But if, just to answer that question of what could you have to pay, 
in the blue box at the top, one, two, three, fifth line down, estimated termination payment. So in column three, assuming everything stayed the same, you did the, lock, the rate lock, you'd have to pay the 475 to terminate it out of your new bond proceeds, but your savings are still 3.2 million. If you go over one column to column four, there, if interest rates dropped 50 basis points, when rates drop, the cost to terminate has gone up. So in that case, you'd have to pay 1.8 million to terminate it, but you're issuing bonds at rates that are 50 basis points lower, so your savings are gonna be greater. When you net those two, you're still at 3.2 million. And so that's that important concept that if the, if the markets are moving together, even if your termination payment went to two million, you're now borrowing at much lower interest rates. And vice versa, when we just uh, complete the thought, if you look at column five, if interest rates rise by 50 basis points, you're actually gonna get paid when you terminate the transaction. So that you get that 770,000 wired into the school district, but, but now you're issuing in, in a higher interest rate environment. But because you just got paid 770,000, that offsets the higher rates that you're gonna issue at, and so it still nets to about three, two. And one final question. I'm, for, I'm fond of the, of the bank loan scenario of three. Will there be a um, presentation on that by a bank, or how, how, how do we, there's no fees with that? Um, how does that work? Sure. Is that you would get Yes, yeah, we, we put that scenario together, because on some of these, we have been finding banks that are willing to give a commitment for the actual loan out for a one-year period. So we reached out to one of the banks that we knew would be able to, to do 36 million for a forward period like this. That's the rate that they gave us. So with the, the cost factored in, you can see that those savings today would be about 2.2 million. And last week when I was here, I said that, you know, that's clearly like the total non-risk, nothing really could go wrong because you're gonna get that commitment now, but you can see that that's not as efficient when you're just going to the bank as the, the markets are. The, the premium that they're building in to deliver that rate on April the 1st is much, much higher. That's why the savings are much lower, but it's They're taking the risk also. It's their risk, Thank right. You. Hello, Joe. I don't know about anybody else, but all this discussion is confuse me more than clarify things. Let me, let me try and put this bottom line for me. If we don't do anything and wait till December, we may save at current rates $3.7 million. Correct. If we do the swap now and interest rates hold until we do the swap, we'll save $3.2 million. Right. And so it, it, it's the question of do we guarantee our savings because if, I'm, if I heard you correctly, in the last 10 days, with the slight rise in interest rates that took place, we've already lost 200,000 in potential savings. That's right, obviously every day rates are moving and, and even if you decided you wanted to authorize us to go do this, we still need a couple of weeks to work with your legal team and you have to have your swap advisor on board so we could come back and the board would still have to take official action to actually do the transaction. So. And it would still, be the rates in place that day. We would, once you would approve it, we would plan to price the transaction the next day after you take your official action. So we're still a couple weeks away from you actually being able to lock in anything on this. But yes, what I think I had opened this, the presentation a week and a half ago, we talked about that if, if people didn't think interest rates were gonna go up at all, if you thought rates were gonna go lower, if you thought they were gonna go the same, or be the same at the end of the year, January, then there's really no point in talking about this option. It was just that it's a lot of savings. The business office said to us, is there, is there an option out there to try and protect a lot of savings? And this is really the only option that there is under these couple scenarios of either doing a rate lock, going to the bank and getting the forward. Those are our only things that help to eliminate interest rate risk. Now, rates could, we do nothing, rates could, rates could be lower come December, and we would have saved even more. 
Can I just ask, so, and I, I think maybe this is what Mrs. White's just sort of trying to get at, I'm not sure, but if a scenario like 2008 happens where the markets don't follow each other, right. we don't have to actually call bonds, right? We wouldn't have to refinance. We would just lose that half a million dollars that we locked in the swap for. We would have to terminate the swap by April 1st, and that cost would be driven by whatever has happened with interest rates. So under that scenario, um, if interest rates have fallen by 50 basis points, you'd have to make that $1.8 million payment to terminate the swap. And but you could wait to issue bonds. Okay. You, you know, you could make that payment and say something was going on with bonds just for, the, for two weeks. And two weeks later now, the market's cleared, interest rates are still low because they're 50 basis points lower and you're still issuing in that lower interest rate environment and so you should be recovering that the real risk would be if it was some extended period of time that we had to terminate because we got to the end of the contract and the market shut down you have no access to issuing debt that, that that's that's the biggest worst case scenario Any other board discussion? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, moving uh, along to number 12. <clears throat> All right, are you going to vote on this? Are you going to vote on 12? I think I've done 12. Make a motion. Yeah. Okay. Roll call vote, please. Oh, we made a motion. oh, I'm sorry. It's been so long since we started talking about it. <laughs> so, I was gonna, so this is uh, this is the correct motion, right? Is it, is, uh, we actually uh, voted on this last meeting. We actually put a motion out there to uh, prepare the necessary, doc necessary documents to uh, refinance the school fees, revenue bonds, series 2007 to the so one or more series of bonds. We're actually voting tonight on, on them working up a new series of bonds or just working on getting the, the swap in place uh, right now. And then issuance new bonds would be better. Is that right? <laughs> He's gonna answer you. We worded it we worded it that way because real what's gonna have to happen is you have to enter into the parameters agreement to issue the new bonds, just like we've done in the past, those last couple of refundings, because under state law, the rate contract has to attach to an issue. So we would be, what we would come back with would be you entering into the agreement for issuing the new debt, and then there would be a separate resolution for the swap transaction that gets attached to that new debt, because under state law, you have to attach it to a finance. Well, like Mrs. Bardowski's question, Mrs. Bardowski's question was that if the, if the bond market does blow up, we, we could, in essence, we don't have to issue or something supposed to go faulty, we're not going to We could move the data around a little bit. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And that's the reason we're doing it as a parameter, so which we talked about over the last two years that gave you that flexibility on your last refinancing. We had to approve it in advance. We were in contact with the business office, and when the time was right, to issue the bonds and, and go into okay. the market okay. it gave us that flexibility. Thank you. Sure. Well, then I'll, I'll make a motion to authorize the uh, RDC uh, Capital Markets as bond underwriter, underwriter and Fox Ross Trial LP, LLP as bond counsel to prepare necessary documents for the refinancing of the school lease revenue bond series 2007 through the issuance of one or more series of bonds and a related interest rate management agreement. I'll second that. <clears throat> First by Mr. Rathkip, second by Mr. Potter. <clears throat> Any other board discussion? I have a comment for the board, please. Just I have a comment for the board. Scott. I'm concerned that we're rushing on a decision without shopping all possible alternatives. Uh, we don't know if there are other financial institutions besides RBC that may do this transaction for less basis points. Concerned that we haven't really discussed fully the bank option or had the bank have the chance to sell this to us via their representative. Um, appears to me we're spending $500,000 for the chance, or more, for the chance to save a million in the current rate scenario. Nobody expects rates to change much this year. Europe just lowered them. 
again, they will fluctuate up and down within a normal, uh, a low range here, uh, most people feel. If we do nothing and rates go up 50 basis points, we can still save $2.7 million and we take on no contract risk. Risk if you go to the bank option. And the worst case scenarios are not even quantifiable by um, Mr. Daly's own admission. I, I urge the board not to rush into this. I don't even think this belongs at a special voting meeting. When by RBC's own words, it can be executed in one day and we're rushing it through on a special voting meeting at the same night it was presented. Our, our constituents haven't had a chance to weigh in on it, and we're rushing through with it. And I, I know I'm a minority, but that's been said. Thank you. Mr. Martino, roll call, please. Mr. Argus O'Neill. Yes. Mr. Potts. Yes. Mr. Rathke. Yes. Mr. Scott. Yes. Mr. Radowski. No. Mrs. Bites. No. Mr. Kurtz. Yes. Mr. Martino. Yes. Mr. Wolf. Yes. Motion passes seven to two. The next item, number thirteen, motion to approve the appointment of Fairmont Capital Advisors Incorporated, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, as a qualified independent representative swap advisor pursuant to CFTC regulation. 23.450 for matters related to a possible cash settled swap in conjunction with the refinancing of the Daniel Boone Area School District Series 2007 SLR bonds and issuance of Series 2017 GOB. So moved. Second. First by Mr. Kurt, second by Mr. Opus and Neil. Any board discussion? Actually, I, I do have a question. I guess ties into uh, some price question. Um, uh, so, uh, in essence, I mean, if, if uh, should this have been voted on first? The only reason I ask is uh, uh, supposing the swap advisor goes out and does find somebody that's more affordable than RBC. Actually, RBC Capital wanted a swap advisor here tonight, but. We had it authorized once, so we wouldn't have one here. Okay. So what's the rush? They were here. I mean, but let me ask this question. I mean, we're not. We don't, we're. You guys authorize. More than still authorize RBC to start working on that. We still have to actually do a final authorization, right? Yes. So if a swap advisor came in and said, "So and so's out there, and they can do this for 15 basis points." We could change the yes. Right. yes, yes, yes. Okay. I think that's an important point to make. It's just what Mrs. White was saying earlier. This is just a step in the process. We haven't agreed to any of this at all yet, other than to move forward and return documents. Okay. Go motion. All right. Oh, you did? Motion by Mr. Kurtz, second by Mr. Okay, that's right. All right. Uh, roll call vote, please. Mr. Potts. Yes. Mr. Rathke. Yes. Mr. Scott. Yes. Ms. Rodowski. Yes. Mrs. Bites. Yes. Mr. Kurtz. Yes. Mr. Martino. Yes. Mr. Ogus O'Neill. Yes. Mr. Wolf. Yes. Motion passes 9-0. Well, we have opportunity for the swap advisors when that would be when that makes us feel better maybe what's the, when's the next uh, finance, finance meeting is until april 7th but we have we have a voting meeting next monday i mean mr small would it be possible to try and get them here next monday thank you motion to adjourn second okay. being in public comment does no, no anybody have any public comments? Okay. Who's sort of first? Who were first? Second. Who's second. All right. Who was first and second? Mr. Kurtz first, Mr. Rathbun second. We adjourn. We're going to immediately.